Last week, we saw the importance of bringing our hunger, our desires to Jesus no matter what they were. And this allows Jesus to satisfy or to heal or to transform or to transcend those desires according to his will. And Jesus was happy to multiply the loaves and feed the crowds regular food last week, knowing that they would be hungry again and that they would follow him looking for more. This time, when they come to him, instead of feeding their hunger, he deliberately stirs up more hunger. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. You thought that bread was good? I've got stuff that means you'll never be hungry again. For people who spend much of their life just making sure they have food for the next day, you can imagine the appeal of such lasting food and drink. They catch the implication, though, that there's still work involved. What can we do to accomplish the works of God for that bread? Jesus isn't promising a freebie. He's just offering a better payout for better work. The same thing is at work in the first reading from Exodus. After the Israelites go to Moses with their hung hunger, God promises to provide for them food in abundance. He does this with the quail, and more importantly, with the manna. We don't read it here, but the Israelites have to go out every morning and do the work of collecting it, and certainly they had to do the work of catching and slaughtering the quail. And on Fridays, for the manna, they had to collect double, because it wouldn't show up on the Sabbath, so they needed to prepare. And one might ask, why the extra steps? Why this specific schedule of miracles? God is already doing a miracle. Why not simply have a complete meal appear in their bowls? Or why not simply take away their hunger and make them miraculously able to do without food, as he has done sometimes? Because we are human beings. And God's miracles lift up our humanity. They don't replace it. It is human to eat. It is human to work. So instead of skipping the working and the eating, he miraculously connects our labors and our hunger to his supernatural gifts. And we often stress the generosity of God, emphasizing that we cannot earn his love, and this is true. Yet we sometimes create this impression that we don't have to do anything in order to receive that love. And that is not true. Not because we have to earn God's love, which we can't, but because we human beings need to labor, to work. It is not love to empower laziness and helplessness and living an inhuman way of life. Ask any good coach. They put their players to hard work because of their love. To love and to be loved requires effort. Prayer takes effort. Liturgy is literally a holy work of the people. Even receiving communion requires the mental preparation, the confession of sins, the fasting ahead of time. So the crowd with Jesus understands that the food that endures requires the works of God, just as the manna and the quail in the desert required gathering and preparing it. What kind of work? For once, Jesus just answers the question instead of asking another one. This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. That's it? Just believe? easy. Is it though? Ask someone in the midst of darkness, anguished by loss and doubt, how easy it is to believe. Read the journals of saints like Therese of Lisieux, Padre Pio, and Mother Teresa, and you'll see just how hard believing can be. We often confuse believing with thinking. 
To believe in the one he sent is not a simple mental decision to say, yes, I think Jesus is God's son. That word belief, that Greek, pistuo, yes, it means belief, but it means trust, confidence, fidelity. And one of the clear differences between a mere idea and belief is what we see in the way a person lives. It is easy for someone to have the opinion that Jesus is real, but if their life is basically unaffected, it's not quite belief, because that belief takes work. And this is why a lot of what divides Catholics and Protestants is semantics. We actually both agree that we are saved by faith and not by our own efforts. Only we Catholics understand that real faith, faith that saves, is work. Do not be afraid of this, though. The willingness to ask questions, to express your doubts, is often part of that work. When the crowds respond to this challenge and ask, what sign can you do that we may see and believe? When they ask for his help to believe, Jesus doesn't rebuke them. That search, that sincere, for now, request is part of the labor. And they turn to scripture, seeing the parallels, and they request his wisdom for what that Old Testament passage about manna means now for them. Do you have doubts? wrestling with questions about our faith. Okay, do the work of believing in response. And part of that work is to search the scriptures with openness and humility. Don't just accept the first skeptical opinion you find on the internet or among your buddies. Actually spend time with the word of God. Look to truly credible sources, just as this crowd goes to Jesus, whom they recognize as a reliable teacher of the word of God. How little they realize he's even more. What other work can we do to believe? Evaluate our actions. How we live and what we believe are mutually influential. You start deliberately taking actions to express belief, and your belief will grow. And your actions will always begin to align with what you really believe. Let's take the Eucharist for an example. Catholics believe the Eucharist is really the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. We did not gather 80,000 people in Indianapolis for a symbol. But we know that Jesus Christ is sent by the Father, not only in the past, but in this special sacrament. Yet do we really believe that? It's one thing to say we think it's true on a survey, but do our actions confirm this? When you come up to receive communion on the hand or on the tongue, consider what were your hands and tongues doing before Mass? or in the week since you last received communion? Did you examine your conscience? Did you really call to mind your sins to repent of them at the start of this Mass? When was your last confession? And when you come up to receive, are you showing reverence, eagerness to receive? Or is it boredom and impatience because Mass has taken 40 minutes already and you're ready to move on? And if you do receive on your hand, do you stop to make sure that none of those particles are still there? Or do you subconsciously just wipe them away, knocking our Lord to the floor? Do you speak Amen and mean it with clarity and conviction when you are told, Body of Christ? Do you prayerfully reflect on what you have received afterwards? And outside of Mass, do we act like the king and creator of the universe is in that tabernacle, dwelling in this sacred temple? Or do we treat it like any other public gathering space? How quickly and loudly does this church echo with chit-chat after Mass? How eager are we to acknowledge the other people we know in this church, but slow to acknowledge the Lord still with us? 
Would a non-Catholic who walks in after Mass have any idea that this church houses someone that is not in their church? Yes, it's hot outside, but we live here. We're used to it. We can manage it a few minutes for a visit with friends outside instead of filling the church with loud and boisterous noise. Bad habits creep in. Good habits grow weak. It's part of our human condition, so we need these reminders from time to time. And so I challenge you as your pastor to reevaluate how you act in this building, how you come to dress in preparation for Mass. Like you're coming to see the king? Or like you couldn't be bothered to tidy up on your way to some errands? Consider how well you keep the one-hour fast, nothing but water and medicine, for at least an hour before, and that means no chewing gum either. Consider how you receive communion and how you act before and after Mass. These are not the only things that matter, obviously, and they can seem somewhat small, but they do matter because how we act affects how we believe. And this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. So do the work for your words, your clothes, your attitude, your body, and your behavior to show that this sacrament, this Eucharist, truly is Jesus sent by the Father to dwell with you. Believe it, and then receive like you believe it, so that you too might endure for eternal life.